Thank you. That concludes the debate on proving access to primary care, and it's time to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 12215 in the name of Willie Rennie on crisis in NHS dentistry. I'd be grateful if members who wish to speak in the debate were to press their request to speak buttons. And I call on Willie Rennie to speak to and move the motion up to seven minutes, please. Just in case you've not had enough of me, um, in, in, in preparation for this debate, I asked for people's experiences of NHS dentistry. I had a tidal wave of responses, and they are still being sent to me this very day. The stories are nothing short of extraordinary. This is apart from SNP supporters who apparently are all registered with NHS dentists, get an appointment before they even ask for it, and even have the shiniest teeth in the whole planet. But it is certainly true that many people do get a good NHS dental service experience, but so many don't. And our job in this parliament is to never stop until everyone gets the service that they need and that they deserve. The steps that people have been taken are nothing short of extreme. These have included DIY dentistry with tools bought on Amazon, travelling hundreds of miles, paying a small fortune sometimes, hunting for an NHS dentist for weeks on end without success. Elaine Stewart couldn't find an NHS dentist in St Andrews, so is still using her parents' address on the West Coast. She's not alone. Naomi Kimber from Newborough is a single mother with no support on universal credit. She can't work. She doesn't drive. She told me this. In one month, I spent almost £400 on x-rays, two fillings and cleaning. This left me short for food, which meant I skipped meals so that my son could eat. That's what NHS dentistry has brought to this young mother. Alfie Cook could not get any treatment during the pandemic. He later paid £2,600 for private treatment because he couldn't get an NHS dentist. Stephen Kelly from Tayport says he's been on a waiting list for four years now. He told me this, I've had to resort to DIY dentistry with dental tools purchased on Amazon. And he puts in brackets, I'm not joking. Another constituent told me he was going to Turkey for treatment because it was cheaper to travel all the way there than incur private costs here. So not only are we getting our ferries from Turkey, but we're getting <laughs> our teeth done in Turkey as well. NHS dentistry is in crisis. It was in trouble before the pandemic. The British Dental Association say the Scottish Government's revised payment system from November last year has made little to no difference. In Fife, there are no dentists accepting new NHS patients. This month, NanoDent in Glenrothes says that they have no choice but to shut for an extended period. Redburn Dental in Kirkcaldy is going fully private due to ongoing pressures. Last year, the Newborough practice in my constituency went private and the Tayport practice closed altogether. A practice called My Dentist in Presswick, Ayrshire, dropped 1,500 patients overnight going private. Almost 82% of NHS dentists in Scotland no longer take new patients, and 83% say, are saying that they will reduce their NHS numbers. So it's bogus, absolutely bogus to claim that because a high percentage are registered with an NHS dentist means that everything is fine. Research by my party last year found that almost half of those registered have not been seen at an NHS dentist in two years. 1.2 million have not had an examination or treatment in five years, and more than 10% haven't seen an NHS dentist in over a decade. New statistics published yesterday by Public Health Scotland reveal that there has been a 25% drop in the number of NHS dental examinations paid between December 23 and December 2019. That's a drop from 195,000 down 50,000. And we should not forget that the SNP have abandoned their promise to abolish all NHS dental charges. But it's worse than that. 
they've increased the charges rather than scrapping them. When the Minister stands up next, her first words should be, there is a problem with NHS dentistry in Scotland. If she does that, then we can have a serious debate about how to fix it. That includes, I believe, a fee system that reflects the true cost of providing treatment, reversing the 35% real terms cut in recent years. Raise the cap on student dentists. Vocational dental training is the entry door to NHS dentistry. We should fund 70 more places to commence this August and give NHS Education Scotland the funds to act quickly. This will open NHS access through, across the country come August with a very moderate financial outlay. And we need to speed up the registration process for overseas dentists, which currently has a three-year wait with a general dental council. We've got the powers to do it in Scotland, so we should get on with it. I know of a dentist who is working as a pizza delivery driver because he simply can't get registered. The Scottish Government must rewrite the failing NHS recovery plan. And let me leave you with this final chilling anecdote. An early, this is a dentist told me this, an early oral cancer has a five-year survival of 80%. A late stage one, only 20%. One oral surgery department reports alarming increases in late presentations of oral cancers. That's something that should send shivers down all of our spines. And this is not, therefore, just about shiny teeth. It is a matter of life and death. Thank you. Can I confirm, Mr Rennie, that the motion was moved? Uh, rookie error. Yes, move the motion in my name. Thank you very much. And I now call on Neil Gray to speak to and move Amendment 12215.2 up to six minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I move the amendment uh, in my name. Uh, the previous uh, debate uh, focused on the importance of care delivered in our communities through and in partnership with general practice. This debate is equally as important and recognises dentistry as an essential linchpin of uh, our primary care system. I will go further uh, and say that it is a key driver in realising uh, our commitment to deliver preventative and proactive health care delivered by sustainable and effective public services working in partnership with patients. It is for this reason that the extension of free dental uh, care to under 26s uh, formed an integral part of this administration's first 100-day sprint uh, and why dental access remains a core tenant of the First Minister's policy prospectus and my own uh, personal mandate from the First Minister. Uh, I will briefly. Sue Webber. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for taking the intervention. You speak about the preventative agenda being foremost at your thoughts, but how can you be preventative in your treatment for dental when it's two years between appointments to check things up? Much can change in that period of time. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'll, I'll come on to some of the, the detail in terms of the work that we are doing uh, with the industry to provide uh, greater capacity uh, to ensure that the member uh, is reassured. Uh, as I said in my early remarks, I welcome these debates as an opportunity to talk in greater detail, even with the short time that we have, about the essential nature of community-based healthcare. So I am grateful to uh, Willie Rennie and Liberal Democrats for doing so. And in talking about dentistry, it uh, would be remiss of me not to set out as necessary necessary context for the debate we're about to enter, the impact that the pandemic has had on dentistry, both for practitioners and for the public who overnight lost access to this vital service. Because it's not hyperbolic uh, to say that the pandemic had and continues to have a seismic impact on the dental sector, possibly more so than any, uh, many other aspects of our health services, due to the nature of dental care uh, and the high reliance on aerosol generating procedures, stringent infection prevention and control measures which were put in place effectively stopping activity uh, overnight. I will give way very briefly Claire Baker. for the last time. Um, thank you very much. Um, could the Cabinet Secretary then explain why the private sector in NHS dentistry is not facing the same pressures post-pandemic as NHS dentistry? Cabinet I, I think that there are pressures across the, denta, uh, the, the dental sector. I don't think it would be fair to say uh, that one, any one element is uh, facing these pressures uh, alone. Uh, and that is why we've come forward with the reform that we have that I'll go into talk about shortly. 
Uh, controls uh, were relaxed. Uh, they were still a significant barrier to full productivity in the sector and thus to dental contractor uh, incomes. The Scottish Government responded with over £150 million of additional emergency financial support to sustain and ultimately preserve the sector. We recognise then and continue to recognise now uh, how important dental care is. So while the immediate impacts of the pandemic are on activity are now behind us in dentistry, the sector continues to feel the impact of the pandemic on access and on available workforce. So this Parliament will recall that all undergraduate and vocational training was suspended for a year at the height of the pandemic due to those same IPC restrictions. And that loss, loss of an entire cohort of 160 dentists is undeniably still felt today and recognised uh, across the chamber, I am sure. So um, I, I also want to uh, address the comments that Willie Rennie uh, made in opening uh, this, this, the, the debate and the awful examples he gave uh, of people uh, seeking NHS dentistry and the, uh, the lengths that some people uh, have gone to uh, in absence of being able to do so. And I recognise that there are challenges, of course I do, uh, and there are the difficulties that have been faced uh, by uh, people uh, of late. Uh, and I recognise as well that the Liberal Democrats have set out their own uh, action plan for dentistry. And I thank uh, colleagues uh, for that plan. Uh, those paying attention will see uh, that in many areas is a direct copy of the very actions that this government is already taking. Uh, their proposed plan outlines intentions to reform the funding structure for NHS dentistry, something that the Scottish Government has already delivered through significant root and branch payment reform on the 1st of November last year. The reformed payment system comprises a completely new fee structure designed to attract dentists to provide NHS care and ultimately improve patient access and building on the commitments we set out in our 2018 Oral Health Improvement Plan. It follows uh, one of the biggest consultations with the dental sector in recent times and is the most substantial reform of NHS dental services since the introduction of the NHS in 1948, backed by a recurring investment from this government of almost half a billion pounds. The data published yesterday shows that almost 400,000 unique patient contacts in NHS primary uh, care dentistry in November 23 alone it doesn't reflect a system uh, which has been suggested as being in crisis. That said, while I'm encouraged by the way the sector has engaged with the play payment uh, reform, I'm not complacent. We recognise that payment reform is not a remedy to all of the ills, and we know that the local access problems do remain in some areas, driven in part by those same workforce problems I alluded to earlier. So again, uh, aligned to the Members' uh, Action Plan, we're already actively consulting with the sector on ways to strengthen the NHS dental work Force, including a greater utilisation of highly skilled dental therapists. And the Public Health Minister has also initiated and led discussions with our counterparts in other UK nations regarding ways in which we can improve the number of overseas dentists coming to the UK. So in this connection, I'm pleased to see that as a result of those discussions, the Department for Health and Social Care has already been moved to consult on reform of this vital pipeline. Presiding officer, in, in summary, I'm under no illusions that the NHS dental sector has faced, continues to face, significant challenges. Uh, and I give my uh, heartfelt thanks to those dentists working in the NHS for the resilience and dedication. The shadow of the pandemic and other external factors uh, are not just in Scotland, but across the UK. However, I am proud that Scotland is the only nation in the UK to actively tackle these challenges head on through significant generational uh, reforms. And this is despite you, already Secretary. a relatively stronger... You must conclude with an NHS dentist. Thank you. I should say that we're very tight for time this afternoon. We have no time in hand. And I now call on Sandesh Gulhani to speak to and move Amendment 12215.3 up to five minutes, please. Thank you. I wish to refer members to my register of interest as a practising NHS GP. Well, there you have it from the Cabinet Secretary. Everything's perfect. SNP plans are perfect. Mr Rennie, why bother having this debate? Well, Presiding officer, members and the public at large may well recall the SNP promise at the last election to make NHS dentistry free at the point of care to everyone in Scotland by the end of this parliamentary session. Three cabinet secretaries, two first ministers, and nearly three years later, this SNP government still has no plan on how to make this possible. The reality is, no matter how big the headline, or indeed how many Scots are registered with a dentist, too many patients can't actually get an appointment to see and access full NHS dental services in the first place. This isn't rocket science. A shortage of dental nurses, a lack of dentists, rising 
costs, including materials and lab works, have left many practices providing NHS services at a loss. It's no surprise practices are folding. This is unsustainable. And the SNP government has been warned time and time again that this would happen. In fact, the SNP shortage of dentists is even holding back Scotland's space industry as engineers are reluctant to relocate to Sutherland because of a lack of dental care. Holyrood, we have a problem. And I remember being at a conference of local dental committees last April when a delegate reminded Minister Jenny Minto that NHS dentistry in Scotland is broken and that the SNP government had broken it. Yesterday's NHS dental data modelling report is telling. The number of people to see an NHS dentist fell by over a third in December 2023. And it begs the question, what are patients doing if they can't see a dentist? Well, under the SNP and its botched management, patients are opting for an alternative model. The SNP DIY model for dentistry. The British Dental Association says 83% of Scottish respondents to their survey said that they treated patients who'd performed DIY on their own teeth since lockdown. Desperate patients taking desperate measures and taking matters into their own hands, literally. Ripping out teeth, super gluing crowns, even using repair kits ordered off Amazon. This is gruesome. We also know that more and more patients are heading overseas for dental care, as Willie Rennie has mentioned. In fact, though, patients are travelling to Central Europe, even India, for standard treatment. Refugees from Ukraine are returning to a war zone for care. But the Cabinet Secretary thinks this is just unfortunate. Presiding officer, this is not medical tourism. It's desperation. Of course, the SNP government, like Corporal Jones, will cry, don't panic and point to its reformed payment system for NHS dentistry. Introduced in November last year, this aims to incentivise dentists to stay in the NHS system. It includes changes to fees for many treatments and reduce the number of treatments available from 400 to 45. While it's too early to measure the real impact of this reform, what we do know is the SNP have just been tinkering with the problem. The BDA warns that the fundamentals of a broken system remained and it's because the SNP government decided to stick with the drill and fill model. All of us working in primary care understand the importance of preventative health care and we know that this delivers better outcomes for patients. And it's also important to understand that oral health can tell us a lot about our overall general health. Regular monitoring identifies and deals with problems early. Problems such as oral cancer, bacterial fungal infections that can cause sepsis. In fact, gum disease is also linked to a higher risk of heart disease and dementia. As the Scottish Conservatives argue in our NHS reform policy paper, we support incentivising preventative health care as it's good for patients but also cost effective. This is what dentists want. It's what they believe in. And when we talk about prevention, we want to go further than just regular checkups. Good health, good oral health, relies on healthy lifestyles. We need to be effective in tackling unhealthy behaviours, including vaping, smoking, alcohol consumption, consuming high sugar foods and beverage. This is so different to the SNP's approach to dentistry, which is geared towards saving the Scottish Government money in the short term and clearly not towards long-term dental health. To conclude, Cabinet Secretary... Back to the drawing board, please. We need a root and branch reform of the statement of dental remuneration so dentists are valued and supported and patients are helped to stay healthy and not just queue in a fixed when things go wrong. And I move the motion in my name. Thank you. And I now call on Paul Sweeney to speak to and move amendment 12215.1 up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome the new Cabinet Secretary to his place. I was missing me in the last debate not to do so, uh, and congratulate the new member uh, on his excellent maiden speech. Um, so the decline in NHS dentistry under Scotland in the SNP, as far as I'm concerned, is frankly scandalous. The Government are driving NHS dental services into the ground. Oral health is consistently a second thought, and we have people across this country unable to sign up to a dentist relying on emergency dental phone lines instead. NHS 24 calls about dental health exceeded 60,000 in 2022. That is an increase of 40,000 compared to four years prior. That is not good enough. 
Scots should be able to access the care they need in their local area and not have to wait until a minor dental issue becomes an emergency to see a dentist. Labour research shows that in recent years, waits for dental surgery have soared. Each of the 14 territorial health boards have seen an increase in the average waiting time for dental surgery. People are waiting close to a year in some parts of Scotland in urgent and excruciating pain for the surgery they desperately need. The government's failure to get to grip with the NHS dentistry issues is, as far too often the case, compounding health inequalities too. In 2022, children and adults from the most deprived areas in Scotland were less likely to have seen their dentists compared to those in the least deprived areas. And the gap between child participation rates with dental care was 20 percentage points between the most and least deprived. Completely unacceptable. And shockingly, just 68% of 10 to 11 year olds in the 10th most deprived areas in Scotland are decay free, compared to 90% in, in the 10th least deprived. A stark contrast. Patients and dentists deserve better. And I can certainly furnish that with a personal anecdote. I've been registered with an NHS dentist for the last 20 years in one of the most deprived communities in Scotland, North Glasgow. And for the first time in my life, from a childhood age up to present, I've been unable to get a routine checkup because the permanent dentist has left and locums continually fail to appear and dental appointments have been routinely cancelled. I've not been able to get a dental checkup for eight months. That's just one personal example, despite repeatedly attempting to book it. In 2006, the last Labour-led Scottish Government introduced the world-leading and ambitious Child Smile programme, giving young people free toothbrushes and toothpaste, as well as two fluoride varnishes a year, vastly improved signs of tooth decay in primary school-aged children. Child Smile is an example of spending to save down the line and improving through life costs. It is about prevention. It's a good example of what the government could be doing much more of in this country. It was also a targeted intervention to close the oral health gap. And that is why I've mentioned it in the amendment to the Liberal Democrat motion today. That foresight and long-termism is missing from the Scottish Government's sticking plaster approach to dentistry, presiding officer. Last year, these benches welcomed the news that the Scottish Government were in conversation with dentists regarding a new payment reform plan to ensure that dentists continue to offer NHS services in light of swathes of dental practices turning away from NHS provision. And often, once they go, they won't be coming back in a hurry. But what the government offered fell short of the mark. And as the British Dental Association has said, the fundamentals of a broken system remain. Dentists regularly come to me to tell me that they have witnessed a huge increase in the numbers of patients presenting signs of DIY dentistry, and I'm sure they have to the ministers too. I mean, you only have to look at the explosion of adverts for self-dental scaling kits available uh, on social media uh, as an indication of what's going on out there. Um, a British Dental Association survey showed that 83% of Scottish dentists have treated patients who have performed DIY dentistry in lockdown. That is simply outrageous. Significant change is needed to the NHS recovery plan to reverse the decline in NHS dentistry so that Scots have access to dental health care when and where they need it. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. We move to the open debate and I call Liam MacArthur to be followed by David Torrance. Uh, thank you, President Officer. A year ago in uh, a similar Scottish Liberal Democrat debate, I suggested that any objective analysis of NHS dentistry across Scotland could only conclude the se sector was in crisis. At the time, the then Health Secretary, now First Minister, was writing out to dentists telling them, quote, how pleased he was at how well the sector was performing. It was the sort of tone-deaf ministerial complacency that had dentists around the country clutching their drills more tightly and possibly even dreaming of an emergency extraction work they would <laughs> love to perform. Twelve months on, and despite changes introduced by the government last November, the BDA insists that NHS dentistry has been, quote, in crisis for a generation, and the action taken by ministers falls short of the root and branch change needed. Willie Rennie has already vividly highlighted the painful uh, consequences of that failure by government to get to grips with the scale of challenge facing the sector. I want to use my time this afternoon to illustrate how uh, this crisis in dentistry is playing out in the islands I represent. As the BDA briefing for this debate makes clear, registration rates for adult patients in Orkney stands at 50%, the lowest in the country. This is no great surprise and comes despite the Herculean efforts of local dentists and staff, but reflects what I've been seeing in my own casework over recent years. And these figures need to be considered in the context of participation rates, contact with a dentist in the last two years, which last summer stood at 50% of all those registered. The fact this is down on the figure from 2021, the midst of the pandemic, 
should flush out any residual complacency in St Andrew's House. In terms of children's participation rates, NHS Orkney's dental lead, Stephen Johnson, has confirmed to me that between 2020 and 2022, this plummeted from 87% to 57%. While overall dental hygiene amongst children in Orkney remains good, there must be a serious risk of problems being stored up over the longer term. Mr Johnson has spoken too of a uh, concerning shift in activity over to the private sector. Again, a trend borne out by my own mailbag and one that I think undermines any claim this government might have, that even basic dental provision in Scotland is free for all at the point of delivery. Addressing this will require the wider reforms set out earlier by Willie Rennie, including a sustainable funding model. Changes to date may have stemmed the exodus of dentists from NHS practice, but as one local dentist told me earlier this week, it won't reopen lists to new registrations. The low margin, high volume funding system doesn't work in island and rural settings. Certain treatments are de facto loss making unless delivered in high numbers, which simply can't be achieved in places like Orkney. On recruitment and retention, where again specific challenges exist in Ireland and rural areas, the lack of clarity on the support available. I raised this with uh, the Minister uh, in Parliament previously and was told that support is being provided where it is most needed. But NHS Orkney and the Remote and Rural Directors of Dentistry Group still appear to be awaiting details of the financial allowances. Meantime, the loss of the fully funded Remote and Rural Fellowship is also being keenly felt. In the past, this scheme was well used by dentists in Orkney, even allowing one to go on to provide orthodontic services prior to 2021. There is now no, no provider of orthodontics locally, leading constituents to contact me, highlighting the impact on their children, uh, for whom there are mental health as well as oral health implications. Replacing the fellowship scheme to improve the recruitment and retention in island and rural areas is urgently needed. Presiding officer, the crisis in dentistry persists. More urgent and concerted action is needed by government, and I urge Parliament to support the motion in the name of Willie Ray. Thank you. And I call David Torrance to be followed by Sue Weber. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We all know that opposition parties don't like to talk about Brexit, but in the context of a debate here today, when approximately 60% of the dental workforce is European, to simply ignore it or pretend that it has played no part in where we find ourselves today is beyond disingenuous. It sim simply cannot be ignored. It is utterly undeniable that Brexit, which all the main parties in Westminster are now signed up for, has had a huge impact on recruitment. Eight long years after Brexit has had a devastating impact on the UK labour market with recruitment of professions within the health and social care sector. It is especially hard. With the rate of EU and European Free Trade Association dentists joining the register halving since the referendum. This is backed by an upfield report on health and Brexit, which states before the EU referendum, constituency well over 500 dentists trained in EU and European Free Trade Association registered in the UK each year. We made up of around a quarter of additions to a workforce. This dropped sharply around the time of the referendum to around half its previous levels and has never recovered. Brexit has brought nothing but harm to people, communities and businesses all across Scotland. And this de debate today is just yet another example of its devastating impact. Scotland needs a migration system that is both humane and meets our social economic needs. And obviously we are certainly not going to get it while we take part in the broken Westminster system. But in the face of these challenges, the Scottish Government remains firmly committed to sustaining and improving patient access to NSH dental services. Despite the challenges presented to a profession because of the global pandemic and the disastrous Brexit, this government has maintained a strong track record in growing NHS dental workforce in Scotland, with 57 dentists per 100,000 of the population, and it continues to work closely with the BDA and others on recruitment and retention of dentists, particularly in the area where it is known that the problem is most acute. It is worth noting that, in respect, Scotland continues to outperform England when it comes to the number of dentists per head, Compared to England's 4.3 dentists, Northern Ireland 6, Scotland has 5.9 and Wales had 4.6. In England, the number carrying out NHS work per head of population hasn't risen in a decade. I'm short for time, so no thank you. It's fair to say that NHS registration is also significantly higher in Scotland than in the rest of the United Kingdom, with more than 95% of our population registered with an NHS dentist. 
The work of the Scottish Government, alongside the British Dental Association, Scotland and the wider sector on payment reform, is the most significant change to NHS dentistry in generation and provides practitioners with a whole new suite of fees that are designed to provide a full range of care and treatment to NHS patients. This reform will provide a long-term sustainability to the dental sector and will encourage dentists to continue to provide NHS care, helping to further mitigate some of the access challenges we are seeing. Payment reform improvement system for both dental teams and patients is the first step in the process to make the services available on NHS effect at changing oral health needs of the population. It also reaffirms the Scottish Government's commitment to the sector and to all NHS patients in Scotland. This modernised system will increase clinical freedom for dentists, will provide long-term sustainability to the sector and encourage dentists to continue to provide NHS care. Scotland is the only part of the UK where free examinations are available to NHS patients, and this will continue. All patients will receive free NHS dental examinations, with these who are exempt, including children and young people under 26, and those on certain benefits continue to re receive free care and treatment. In conclusion, President Officer, I believe that the people in Scotland do recognise and appreciate this Government's commitment to sustaining and improving patient access to the NHS dental services. And earlier this week, I received a call from a constituent who wanted to reach out after hearing about the debate planned for this afternoon. The gentleman wanted to highlight his recent experience in on accessing emergency treatment. He was of firm belief that he would not get the level of quality of care he received anywhere else but in Scotland. The presiding officer is an improving picture in the NHS dentistry, and building on his progress is an absolute priority for the Scottish Government. Thank you, and I call Sue Webber to be followed by Claire Baker. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Two years ago, the Scottish Conservatives held a debate that was called Preventing the Collapse of NHS Dentistry in Scotland. And two years on from the de debate, here we are, with NHS outcomes in Scotland worsened. Uh, waiting times for all sorts of NHS treatments uh, have, have increased. And here we are, explaining that dentistry has got no better in that time. It's clear that the SNP government has failed to do what's necessary to restore NHS de uh, dentistry activity levels to the pre-pandemic rates. And so this raises concerns further that rural and more deprived areas are likely to suffer even more disproportionately uh, with negative oral health as a result of this. And indeed, 90% of respondents to a recent BDA survey say they believe that oral health inequalities in Scotland are on the rise. Oral health can tell us a lot about our general health. Uh, regularly monitoring uh, identifies and deals with problems early, not just oral issues, but yes, oral cancers. And we've heard uh, from Willie Rennie about the impact of late presentations and the catastrophic effects it can have on survival, but also bacterial and fungal infections that cause sepsis. Gum disease is also linked to higher risk of heart disease and dementia. Both are diseases that cause a disproportionate number of deaths in Scotland. However, dentistry is becoming harder to access with waiting times increasing. And the 2023 British Dental Association survey of general dental practitioners uh, showed that nearly 60% had reduced the amount of NHS work they undertook since lockdown. And four in five say they plan to reduce their commitment further in the year ahead. And all the while, patient numbers are increasing. Dental practices are abandoning the NHS in droves for private practice, leaving many Scots without an NHS dentist. Failure to act risks sparking an exodus from the workforce that will leave families across Scotland losing access to NHS dentistry for good. Many Scots are not having dental treatment, with almost half of the people registered with an NHS dental, dentist in Scotland not having seen a dentist in the past two years, where 1.2 million people have not had a dental examination or treatment in five years. The crisis in access to NHS dentistry in Scotland has resulted in many desperate patients taking matters into their own hands with the NH uh, with DIY dentistry or heading overseas for care, which we have heard from many uh, members, and resorting to putting superglue on their dentures should really be a wake-up call to all of us. Worrying the gap between the most deprived and least deprived children who have seen a dentist when the last two years has widened. In 2021, 55% of the most deprived children had seen a dentist, compared to 73% for the least deprived children. And in September 2022, that had risen to 56% of children from the most deprived backgrounds had not seen a dentist in the last two years, or had, sorry, I'm getting myself a bit tongue-tied, it's hot in here. Uh, 
compared to 76% for the least deprived children. And let's remember NHS dentistry in Scotland was in crisis long before COVID hit. So the SNP must get a grip on the situation and bring forward a credible plan to restore routine dental care and tackle the enormous backlog. Robert Donald, the chair of the BDA Scottish Council, has warned there could be a wholesale exodus, as I mentioned earlier, of the profession from the NHS if ministers fail to make a serious long-term commitment to the sector. For too long now, people have gone without access to full NHS dental services. To tackle this unprecedented challenge, dental practices need support from the Scottish Government. So, Mr Gray, the new Cabinet Secretary and the SNP must offer more solutions. Healthcare, staff and patients have been repeatedly let down. The, S the recovery plan is not fit for purpose. We want a plan that is clear to deliver modern and efficient local NHS and for dentistry specifically, presiding officer, this means an end to drill and fill and prioritisation of prevention and one that reflects modern dentistry. Thank you. And I call Claire Baker to be followed by Gillian Mackay. Um, thank you, President Officer. As Willie Rennie has highlighted in Fife, we are seeing more people struggling to get access to NSS dentistry. And David Torrens can make a defence of the Scottish Government if that's what he wishes to do, but he must also recognise that constituents in Kirkcaldy have recently been told at Redburn Dental Practice that is going fully private, and he will have constituents who won't be able now to access an NHS dentist. The Scottish Government point to 95% of Scots registered with an NHS dentist, but following the introduction of lifetime registration in 2010, there is little this figure actually tells us. Far more relevant is the percentage of people who have seen an NHS dentist in the past two years, and that is only around half of those who are registered. The dental statistics published this week, unfortunately, do not give an update to this. I hope that further future publications will um, assess any impact on the changes of access to NHS care. We need more um, information on registration because registration numbers, uh, they don't show that a third of children registered haven't seen a dentist in the past two years. Uh, they don't include the fact that people who are registered with a practice but currently without a dentist within it are unable to access routine treatment and they don't include patients who are currently at practices which will close in the next couple of months who in the meantime cannot get an appointment. Registration without access to dentistry is meaningless. Uh, recruitment and retention are clear challenges. The overall increase in dentists since 2010 has evaporated since the pandemic and issues with supply of dentists from training or from other countries is a major pressure on the system. In evidence to the COVID-19 Committee on Dentistry, it was noted that private, private practice was not experiencing the same difficulties. But we know dentists are leaving NHS practice and that practices are struggling to recruit new dentists. Practices are closing and they're leaving patients without access to care. So in Fife, NanoDent in Glenrothes will close in April due to a lack of staffing. One dentist is moving to another practice, but all adult patients with other dentists will be deregistered. Patients are struggling to get appointments for the past two years due to low staffing, and that struggle will now continue as they try to find somewhere else in Fife offering NHS care. Another practice in Glenrothes is to relocate many of its dentists, sorry, many of its patients to a dentist 14 miles away in Cowden Beath. For those who are relying on public transport, there are then real issues around accessibility. In letters advising of closures, patients are being told it proved impossible to recruit dentists. The letter also recognises the difficulties in finding a dental practice that is willing to accept NHS patients. More than 8% of NHS practices in Scotland are no longer taking on new patients, with a similar number reducing their lists. As of this morning, as has been the case for some time, there are zero NHS dentists in five taking on new patients, whether you are under 26 or not. For those patients looking to register with a dentist, there is nothing they can do but wait. Out of over 50 listed NHS dentists, only two practices in Fife are even operating waiting lists. The BDA is clear that lower attendance at dentists will result in a higher dental disease burden down the line, with health inequalities expected to widen further. The organisation is also clear that the changes brought in last year were not the root and branch reform those in the profession sought. Instead of shifting to a more preventative-based system, the Scottish Government has merely tinkered with the drill-and-fill model, and it's not clear how that will make NHS dentistry a more attractive place to be for practitioners or improve access for patients. The promise of free dental care was all for all was not made pre-pandemic. It was made at a point where dental services had been heavily impacted. 
and we know that there would be ongoing consequences. But not only are the majority of Scots still paying for dental treatment, since November they are now pay paying even more for, than they used to. I am concerned that rather than providing quality free dental care, we're in a situation where people are being pushed into using private dentistry with no other option available to them. The changes made in November must only be the beginning of a much more comprehensive reform if we are to see a future for NHS dentistry. Thank you. And I call Gillian Mackay to be followed by Fergus Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As with the previous debate, I wanted to start by thanking all the professionals working within dentistry for their hard work and the BDA for their briefing ahead of the debate. I met with the BDA on Monday and had a good discussion about several of the issues that have been covered so far in the debate today. The raised issues particularly relating to the backlog created by the pandemic that practices across the country are working hard to overcome. With regular checkups not happening during the pandemic, many changes or problems that would have been picked up early have only surfaced when patients experienced pain and disease was much further advanced. We've heard many stories of people not being able to get access and the potential risks of that. The pandemic has undoubtedly had an impact on the delivery of the Child Smile programme, with children missing out on the programme for a time. The Good Brushing Education on, an education on Oral Hygiene Habits this programme produced are incredible, as well as the preventative measures mentioned earlier in the debate. And I would be grateful for an update from the Minister about the status of the programme at the moment and whether there is an opportunity for those who may have missed some of the programme due to the pandemic to be caught up. In our conversation on Monday, the BDA, the BDA acknowledged the difference in administrative burden the reformed payment structure gave, but that the outcome and the effect of that structure can't be known as yet. And their briefing to us today said the same. Some patients may still be on a course of treatment, which was started under a code on the previous fee structure, and so the full effect may not be seen for some time. I asked the BDA about what the measure of success of the new payment structure looked like, and I think it would be useful to have that clearly laid out from both the BDA and the government. No two practices are the same in terms of size, structure and services, and rural and urban practices have their own differences and challenges too. When it's so difficult to compare practices, it would be useful to define what the measure of success is for the new payment structure and when we may actually be able to see some of that coming to fruition. There is also a widening gap in the registration levels between the least and most deprived areas, especially in children. More needs to be done to ensure that parents take up registration where they can and that where there are difficulties, parents are given the support to find care. Some of the causes behind a dip in registrations are complex and I believe we need to fully understand the dip in registrations and address it urgently. In my conversation with the BDA earlier this week, they also raised issue with access to general anaesthetics for dentistry in hospitals and the number of cancellations. The greatest number of general anaesthetics administered to children is for dental issues. This can be for a multitude of reasons, but is often to reduce the trauma for invasive procedures where children can't tolerate the same level of treatments as adults may be able to. This is also relevant, however, for adults who have a disability or a particular medical condition that requires that enhanced treatment. It's a waiting time that's often overlooked, and in the interest of making a helpful suggestion somewhere in this debate, I hope that the Cabinet Secretary or the Minister may raise this with health boards to ensure that people are getting the treatment they need in the manner that they need it. We need to closely monitor the changes that have been made recently to dentistry and ensure that they are achieving everything they need to while promoting good oral health and hygiene and reinforcing programmes such as Child Smile to ensure good oral health for all. Thank you. And I now call Fergus Ewing, the final speaker in the open debate. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, like all other members in this debate, um, my constituency office receives a huge number of people who present with very serious problems uh, because of the lack of access to NHS dentistry. For a while, people had to go to Invergordon, the nearest place to access one instead of Inverness. Um, I see no point in using the short time I have to repeating these stories, but they are toe curling, as, as Willie's were, Willie Rennie's were, presenting officer to begin with. I did, as a result, of course, raise these concerns with Jenny Minto, the Minister, 
and uh, she pointed out to a suite of a range of actions. And I have to say, um, I was extremely impressed with the minister's demeanour, uh, the obvious care and time that she had devoted to this matter, and the follow-up response, which outlined a number of these measures. And I'd be grateful if she might say how progress is being made on the, the access initiative, the recruitment and retention allowance, and the remote areas allowance. Um, so I praise the Minister for that, and as members may have noticed, I do tend not to sprinkle praise around Ministers characteristically. Uh, perhaps that's a failing on my part, of course, but it's for others, that's for others to judge. But what I really wanted to say today was really to make <coughs> the wider case that I put in the last debate, because it applies, uh, as the lawyers say, mutatis mutandis, uh, just as we see a flood of young people leaving Scotland to practice their medical profession elsewhere in the world. Uh, so we are seeing nurses, teachers and dentists doing likewise. I don't know how many numbers there are. I was heartened that uh, the new cabinet secretary uh, said that he would get the data. And I think it's very important. Certainly I will. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful to Fergus Ewing for accepting my intervention. Fergus Ewing is rightly talking about the issue of potential bonds on new dental graduates, but is he also interested, as we are, in how easy it is to register overseas dentists coming to work in Scotland? Because right now, that process is glacial, and we heard the example of Willie Rennie's constituent, who is working as a pizza delivery driver, but wants to practice dentistry in this country. Fergus Ewing. Well, I totally agree with that. I think... Um, uh, unnecessary bureaucratic imposts are one of the real things that are holding Scotland back across the range. And incidentally, I was heartened to see that the new Cabinet Secretary undertook in this first statement that he would be seeking reform. And that's why I'm making this speech, because I'm trying to be helpful. Um, now, uh, th these, these ideas of a bond are not new, they're not mine. I'm a, a, a practised plagiarist. And our job, I suppose, is to garner ideas from the public, from people who approach us. And I was accosted in the street by a lady, a somewhat elderly lady, who told me of our plans. And she kindly sent me a very detailed note. She's not my constituent, so I can't take the matter up from her. But she did describe her experience as a teacher in New South Wales and Australia, where teachers that left Australia were required to pay back some of their training costs. Uh, and I believe she had mentioned other countries in the world, but I'm no expert on that. The Cabinet Secretary can get his hordes of civil servants to do the necessary research, I'm quite sure. But there were also provisions that the teachers had to go up to the outback, up to the rural parts, and that meant that the schools and the hospitals in rural states in Australia had a sufficient provision of personnel. So actually, the biggest beneficiaries, Cabinet Secretary of what I'm advocating would be the Highlands and Islands. It would be, it would be Beatrice Wishart's constituents. It would be Mr. Eagle's new constituents. It would be mine. And therefore, that's why I felt it appropriate to put forward this case. Presiding officer, I hope I've, uh, I've made the point. I do hope the, the government and the cabinet secretary with his enthusiasm uh, of uh, a newbie will adopt this policy. And I think the public would very much welcome it. Thank you. And we move to winding up speeches. And I call on Carol Mocken up to four minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. And I'm pleased to close this second debate for Scottish Labour. And again, thank the Liberal Democrats for bringing this important uh, debate forward in their own time. Um, I think, listening to the debate, it is fair to say that NHS dentistry in Scotland is in crisis. Patients cannot get an appointment Dentists are leaving NHS practices and it is our constituents and communities that are suffering. <coughs> I do want to note, though, that Willie Rennie acknowledged that when services are available, they are, of course, of a high provision. Dentists are doing the best job that they can for their patients. Um, I think despite what perhaps some in the back benches think, this is a crisis that Ha, much, it, it does come under much of the government's making um, and it should, I think, worry them that I do not think a single member of the public 
really trust them to be able to fix it. So they need to demonstrate that they can take action that will fix it. And in the amendment today, the Cabinet Secretary again goes for this blame everyone factor other than talk about what the government's involvement is. It is quite remarkable how often we have to go over this. Um, but if I'm honest, it's not surprising. But we have all talked about the information that we get in our inboxes from constituents. It is an insult to dentists and to patients not to acknowledge some of the things that the government itself have not put in place. I think it's fair to say that it is a very self-congratulatory SNP amendment that calls for Parliament to welcome the government's strategically prioritising dentistry access after 17 years in power. And, presiding officer, they thank dentists for their continued commitment. I think we all know from our inboxes that dentists stay in the NHS because of their commitment to the NHS. And for patients, I think it's little wonder that they feel that they are being forced out of NHS dentistry and um, that they are unable to get an NHS dentist. Um, I think, of course, it is right that we do acknowledge the impact of the pandemic on dentistry um, due to the face-to-face -face nature of, of dentistry. We know that dentists um, have, are, are by no means recovered, um, but it would be di entirely disingenuous to suggest that is, this is only um, a post-COVID problem. And the words, and it's been mentioned by other members, of the chair of the BDA Scottish Dental Practice Committee, it really made me think, and I, and I just quote them again, the fundamentals of a broken system remain unchanged. The government have stuck with a drill and fill model designed in the 20th century. I, you know, and, and I know from what we've, we've heard from the dental profession is that they did try to help the Scottish government get this right. But probably um, the member, David Torrance, in the, the back row needs to listen that the dentists themselves are saying there's been no changes to the model of care. And despite recent changes in the payment system, NHS dentistry remains in dire straits with a two-tier system and increasing reality for patients. And, presiding officer, it feels like sticking plasters and it will not cut it. Um, so this is from the dentists and the dentist professions. I want to just also mention um, the oral cancer stats that were given by Willie Venny, an important fact that's why we have to get this uh, resolved. I know that I'm running out of time, but I thought Claire Baker gave us some excellent statistics and the front benches should really look at them. There is evidence in the COVID-19 committee that private dentistry is not experiencing the same exit of dentists. This is an important part of the inequalities that are happening. Yes, Thank you, yes. presiding officer. Thank you. And I call on Tess White. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Shocking new figures released yesterday have revealed the scale of the crisis in Scottish dentistry. In December last year, the number of patients able to see an NHS dentist fell by an astonishing 38%. Today, Gillian Mackay talked about regular checkups not happening since the pandemic, and mainly because of the pandemic, but Mr Sweeney was fine during the pandemic and afterwards, but he said that today he's been waiting nine months to be seen. And I have a constituent in Angus in complete despair and significant pain that he can't find an NHS dentist. And that is recent and that is now. The number of NHS dental procedures fell by as much as 200,000. The Cabinet Secretary proudly states his government has a free dental care to the under 26. But the sad reality, presiding officer, is that they cannot find an NHS dentist to treat them. 80% of NHS dentists are no longer taking on new patients and 83% say they will reduce their NHS numbers. Is it any wonder in Scotland that people are having to travel thousands of miles for dental treatment. And as we've heard today from Willie Rennie, it's not just ferries that come from Turkey, but people are having to go to Turkey for their teeth to be fixed. And as Dr. Sandesh Gulhani said, they're going to India, and refugees are going from Scotland back to war zones to have their teeth fixed. Keith Brown said today that Neil Gray was one of his most capable colleagues. 
Neil Gray says he recognises the challenges. Cabinet Secretary, this SNP government has decimated NHS dentistry and patients are paying the price. And as Dr Gulhani said, NS SNP is tinkering with a problem with an outdated drill and fill model. Sue Webber today talked about the fact that oral health is a good indicator of general health. We're hearing harrowing stories again and again of DIY dentistry with people resorting to Amazon to purchase their own tools for self-treatment. And, presiding officer, these aren't isolated incidents. According to the BDA, 83% of dentist respondents to a recent Ms. White, survey... if I might just stop you for a second. I am aware of several conversations going on across the chamber. I'd be grateful if they could... Maybe the, thank you, President. Maybe the SNP don't want to hear the British Dental Association. Will I say again, for those colleagues who are talking and who are standing, chatting to one another at the back of the chamber, presiding officer, according to the British Dental Association, 83% of dentist respondents to a recent survey reported treating patients that had performed some form of DIY dentistry since lockdown, such as using superglue to fix a crown or pliers, as many of us know, to remove teeth. This is Dickensian dentistry. No one, no one should have to pull their own teeth out or use superglue to repair their dentures. It's disgraceful. For so long, for too long, the public has been told that prevention is better than cure. But 1.2 million people have not had dental, a dental examination or treatment in five years. And Carol Mocken said today that the SNP Green government blames everyone rather than themselves. And they have a track record of 17 years managing decline. In our latest health paper, the Scottish Conservatives have committed to a root and branch reform of the statement of remuneration. So dentistry is financially viable and delivers a modern best practice focused on prevention. Finally, presiding officer, Neil Gray says he's not complacent, but he must heed the warnings of the experts. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Jenny Minto, up to five minutes, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I would like to pass on my thanks to all of those in the dental profession for the work they do to maintain the dental health of the people of Scotland. Um, this has been a really interesting and helpful debate, um, and I want to be clear that the introduction of payment reform on 1 November 2023 has been a key intervention to improve patient access to NHS dental care. These changes were made and were done in close collaboration and partnership with dentists. The Scottish Government has acted with a significant intervention by introducing major NHS dental payment reform. We have substantially improved fee per item payments to provide pricing that better reflects the increased cost of modern dentistry. And in addition, we pay a premium on fees to dentists working in our more deprived communities. I recognise when I introduced uh, this payment reform that it isn't the magic bullet. It is part of a comprehensive plan of reform. And that is what I'm working on. Actually, I'd like to continue, uh, Mr Rennie. Um, and that is what I am working on with my officials and directors of dentistry uh, across the NHS health boards. As the Cabinet Secretary highlighted and others have mentioned, the necessary interruption in the training of undergraduate newly qualified dentists during the pandemic led to a significant impact on the introduction of homegrown talent to the sector. We are working to look at that. Training has now resumed and in August 2023 we have around 160 vocational trainees and anticipate around 170 from August 2024. I think we've also, um, Sue Weber raised the point about frequent dental examinations. Um, we haven't reduced the number of dental exa examinations. We've followed NICE guidelines. And actually, this will allow dentists to have better conversations with those with poorer oral health to potentially be seen more often than under previous arrangements. And I think that is incredibly important as part of the preventative uh, side of the work, the, the key work that dentists do. Before Brexit, around one in 10 dentists working in Scotland were from the EU, and in some rural board areas, 
the percentage was much higher. So as a result of this, I personally initiated and led discussions on exploring ways in which we could improve the registration process for international dentists on a four-nation basis, as regulation of health professionals is reserved. I welcome the outcome of that meeting with my uh, counterparts um, and the consultation published last week by the UK Department of Health and Social Care to consider provisional registration with the General Dental Council for International Dentists. And I want to be clear that the Scottish Government will design any regulations and framework alongside health boards and NHS Education Scotland to support any international dentists that come to Scotland to practice so that they can safely follow that journey. I think that's incredibly important. In addition to the full resumption of Scottish training programmes and improvements in overseas pipelines, the Scottish Government is clear that further short-term actions are required to boost available dental workforce. And I've met with the directors of dentistry and the health boards to discuss these. We're actively considering whether we can better utilise our highly skilled dental therapists to provide dental care without the assistance of a dentist, as is currently the case. And I'm pleased to say that a short-life working group comprising of NHS dentists and dental care professionals working alongside officials has been convened to make recommendations as to how the best way to implement this is. I'd like to thank Fergus Ewing for his comments. If I'm honest, I was waiting for a but, but thank you very much. And in the vein of what Fergus Ewing has suggested, I would like to offer a round table with MSPs that have taken part in this debate. I want to be clear that the Scottish Government continues to work closely with NHS boards to support them in identifying tailored solutions to these local access problems. And by providing grants, for example, uh, the SDAI up to 100,000 for opening a new or extending an existing practice in an area. And we've also got golden hello payments of up to 37,500 for new trainee dentists practicing in the area. And I, that is an idea I note that the UK Government has just announced for England. In the meantime, I've been assured that unregistered patients will continue to be able to access emergency and urgent dental care via public dental service clinics. And Child Smile, as uh, mentioned by Paul Sweeney, absolutely, I think it's a great, important um, piece. And the statistics that we got this year, 82% of primary seven children in October 2023, having no obvious decay compared to 53% in 2005, shows that a, a policy that was introduced by the Labour government, um, but has been continued and invested in and expanded by the, this SNP government is a, a real success story. And I would also Minister. make a point that uh, yet another idea that England has copied Scotland in. I believe the only way to protect our NHS dental services is through independence. Until that is achieved, this Scottish Government will continue Thank to you, work Minister. with partners I must to address ask you the challenges of NHS dentistry Thank you. to deliver sustainable services for the people. I now call on Alex Cole-Hamilton to wind up the debate. Up to oh, six minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I'm rather dismayed you cut the Minister off because I wanted to hear how the bombshell of independence was going to in any way improve any aspect of healthcare in this country. Um, Presiding Officer, it was, a, it was a year ago, a whole year ago, the Liberal Democrats used our one day of opposition debate time to raise this crisis in NHS dentistry. Marie Todd said at the conclusion of that debate, in, the, in her words, NH, NHS dentistry was well on the road to recovery. Well, a year on, and in large tracts of Scotland, NHS dentistry is dead on arrival. There's no question about it. As we've heard over the course of today's debate, there is a crisis in NHS dental care in this country. My, my party warned the government about it last February, and in the in interim, they have done very little to stop the rot. And I can't remember an occasion, presiding officer, when we have debated this in government time. There's a fundamental point, a fundamental flaw to the government's rebuttal in this debate, where once again, they lean on the global pandemic as an excuse for the problems that we see in NHS dental care. Well, while that may be true, for the delays in treatment that people suffered as a result of the hard stop on aerosol-generating procedures during the months of lockdown, it doesn't explain 
why so many of our dental practitioners are leaving the NHS profession and leaving the delivery of NHS care. It's got nothing to do with the pandemic. In truth, the SNP have abandoned NHS dentistry. And while changes have been made to the payment structure for NHS de dentists, as uh, the government benches were, were quick to talk about today, it's not enough. Listen to the BDA. They say this is tinkering with a structure for which the fundamentals are structurally un unsound. And I say to the government backbenchers, look at your casework bags. Look at your casework bags. I can't believe you aren't getting this as well. Like Willie Rennie, like others, I have heard testimony unbidden and requested from my uh, constituents who tell me, you know, awash with human pain. I'm hearing more and more every day from constituents struggling to get an appointment, including one with a 14-month-old baby who just can't get registered. Another constituent who was unable to get an appointment after several attempts said, it saddens me that the NHS dentistry service is so much worse now than when I was a young child in the 1960s and the 1970s. Willie Rennie gave us a litany of human suffering from his casework bag in North East Fife, and he is not alone. This is not a case of um, dentists leaving the profession or leaving NHS dental care because of some rush to capitalism or profiteering, but as a symptomatic of a model of a free fee structure that is just fundamentally no longer fit for purpose, that the British Dental Association have been crying out to this government to address for a very long time. As Willie Rennie rightly said, um, far from scrapping NHS dental charges in their entirety, the ones that remain, the ones that people, for people who can still access NHS dental treatment, are seeing those charges increase. Shame on them. We have produced solutions in our uh, amendment and our motion today. Firstly, we must engage with the dental profession on a fundamental redesign of the fee structure. We should look to registration. The minister was quite quick to address Willie Rennie and say that this was a reserved matter. But well, it's not just the General Dental Council that uh, deals with registration, but the Royal College of Surgeons in Glasgow and in Edinburgh is so empowered to deal with it. So let's work with them to make it easier to have foreign workers come and deliver dental care in this recovery. And then fundamentally, we need to reform the recovery plan, not just for dentistry, but for primary care as well. In the earlier debate this afternoon, the recovery plan is no longer worth the paper it is written on, and clinicians across the board are crying out for this government to change it. Cabinet Secretary made his protestations um, that, we, that he'd taken on board our plan, but that will be a cold comfort to the constituents we've heard about today. And Sandesh Gilhani, I think, was right to expand on the extreme measures that people are being driven to. Presiding officer, when our Ukrainian refugee guests to this country who have sought safe harbour in Scotland are prepared to brave the Shahed drones and Iskander missiles of downtown Kiev to access dental care for want of an NHS dentist in this country, then something is fundamentally wrong. We've heard several times as well about the very important early warning system that dental care can offer, that oral cancer, if it's caught early, is eminently survivable. But the amount of time we're asking our patients to wait between appointments, that early warning, those early warning signals and vital clinical signs are being missed. Paul Sweeney, I thought, was excellent and absolutely right to point to the fact that 83%, we know the empirical measurement of how extreme things are in our community, when 83% of our dentists are telling us, presiding officer, that they have patients in their practice for whom they are having to um, deliver remedial work on for botched DIY dental work they've tried to undertake on themselves. Things are Dickensian. It is terrible and it is extreme. And Liam was quite right when he said that they won't open lists to, to registration. The, 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 any tinkering around the edges may have changed things or stopped the exodus. But they won't open lists to um, registration for new patients. And for those, case work, the, for those casework examples, those constituents we all know of who've been jettisoned from NHS care or have moved into the area, the damage is already done. They're out in the wilderness. Nobody is looking after their teeth. Presiding officer, um, Fergus Ewing, in a typically refreshing speech, I think gave the lie to all of those government backbenchers who clearly aren't attending to their casework in trades. David Torrance, I think, the extremist example of that, considering he wasn't even aware his own um, surgery was closing to new patients. Uh, I'm aware you want me to close, uh, presiding officer. It is emblematic of the rot. 
that has set in due to Let's 17 years Hamilton. of SNP incompetence and, yes, ministerial disinterest. I make no apology for that. It's exactly what this is. Um, one of my constituents put it best. I'll say this in closing. When she wrote, is, is this situation only going to get worse? Dental treatment only if you can afford it? Why is nobody in authority concerned about talking about this? Why indeed, presiding officer? Why indeed? Thank you. That concludes the debate on crisis in NHS dentistry and it's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 12233 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme and I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you. No member has asked to speak on the motion. And the question is that motion 12233 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed. And the next item of business is consideration of business motion 12234 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on timetabling of a bill at stage two. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press their request to speak button now and I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you and moved, presiding officer. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 12234 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion 12235 on designation of a lead committee. And I ask George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move the motion. Moved, presiding officer. Thank you, Minister. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. There are nine questions to be put as a result of today's business. And can I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Neil Gray is agreed to, the amendment in the name of Sandesh Gilhani will fall. And the first question is that amendment 12214.2 in the name of Neil Gray, which seeks to amend motion 12214 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton on improving access to primary care, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we'll move to a vote and there'll be a short suspension to allow access to digital voting systems.